Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I too want to uh, thank uh, the Center for Humans and Nature as well as the Botanical Gardens. Uh, from the time I can remember, I knew that I was uh, born in a special time and this was a very serious thing and I am a doer. And so I have been uh, drugged <laughs> out of the trenches uh, and I think uh, this weekend I've even been able to take off my boots. <laughs> At first, I uh, thought, hmm, I don't know my place uh, among all of these uh, distinguished people um, as a physician and a, a trench person. <laughs> uh, certainly, I was cross-pollinated here, and I'm very grateful. So I, uh, as, you, as you heard, I am a, a woman, a physician, a healer, a mother, a wife, and I am the daughter, uh, a daughter of the Choctaw Nation. And since uh, 1491, when the passenger pigeon still darkened the sky, our people have experienced cascades of loss, cascades of loss. Uh, first was the loss of our place. Uh, m my mother's, mother's, mother's nation gave 28 million dollars, 28 million acres, I wish it was dollars, 28 million acres to the colonialist with no concept at all of what that meant, uh, with really in good gesture and hoping that there would be some good things that would come from that, from the Mississippi uh, all the way to Alabama was given away and we lost our place, our connectedness with nature and where our people had vision and settled. And with that loss of place came captivity, not only just of ourselves, our families, our community, but also the earth stripped open and made to grow things that she had never grow with the skills that we had. Most people don't understand that we, the sons and daughters of the ancient ones from Turtle Island to Al Capelan, were brought here to create agricultural wealth or were already here to create agricultural wealth because of the knowledge that we had and our relationship with the earth. We were absolutely awesome stewards of one of the most pristine forests uh, that trees huge stood tall side by side from the Mississippi to the Atlantic, from Canada to the Gulf. We were made to do something that we had never, ever, ever imagined. And with the loss of place and the loss of our connectedness, to our ways, and unlike Robin, I don't know my language, I don't know my dances, I don't know rituals. We lost, yes, our culture, and we lost our identity. And sure, as in the Dr. Martin Luther King speech in the March on Washington, in the second paragraph, the Negro is exiled in his own land, and so, We've come to make good on a bad check, a check marked insufficient funds. And so during the civil rights era, we all had hope, all of us in spectrums of color and background, that perhaps humanity was making a strong advance in what was fair and just. But unfortunately for our people, what we lost with integration was a loss of community. And now the woman who was your teacher that lived next door to you and you would see her when you went to class or whether you went uh, to the store or she would actually call you over to do some chores. And those eyes that were in the back of your mother and father's head were really the eyes of all the elders who were constantly watching you as if they had given birth to you. That was all gone as we pursued degrees 
And as those of us integrated and amalgamated into a world in a way that we thought from the very start was far better than ours. And so now our children are killed every day. They're incarcerated every day. For we've even lost our economy. The good part about integration was that at least we had people that looked like ourselves who could do every single thing that there was needed. Plumbing, electricity, carpentry, insurance, attorneys, doctors, teachers, and they loved you. There was no question in their mind if you were inferior or if you were less than. They knew that you carried the hopes and dreams and they made sure that they took good care of you. Our children don't have that. And so with each succeeding generation, there's been more and more and more loss and more grief and more destruction and a more of a sense of resignation and victimization. And so I'm here to tell you about a story, a story of a walk that we're walking to overcome the victimization, to overcome the resignation. For we, in truth, are the celebration of resilience. Our mothers and fathers, they kept living for this day that would be different, that there would be possibility. And we're, however torn, we are the remnants and the remains of who they are. We're the continuation. And so we have started the recovery. The recovery from all of this loss. We're preparing to go down that, the seventh fire. We're preparing to make it down that green path. And so we're picking up and putting in our pouches all the things that we have forgotten, we're remembering. And so that's kind of showed up in the form of the Healthy Food Hub. Uh, at Black Oak Center for Sustainable and Renewable Living, we're committed to facilitating our communities and being resilient. And we thought the best place to begin that process was with food. And uh, the visible part, the obvious part, the logical and pragmatic part is that we all have to eat. But with eating and, and us as humans, we have this ancient, ancient process where we can strengthen our communities in the process of, of eating. So believe it or not, we, uh, we actually uh, have this collective vision in the community and the possibility of creating wealth through food. Uh, we are, have been working for five years now on the food access and distribution component. The Healthy Food Hut was born in 2009 out of a demand for local food. Uh, we were at Trinity United Church of Christ and literally the community uh, had a transformation in their health. We had decreased blood pressures, uh, diabetes uh, was improved, cancer recovery. And so people would come to the market and request that the market not end. They were really scared. Uh, we had folks who had learned what new foods were and what the healing qualities were of them. And so they would actually go home and try things and bring things back to the market and share them. It was just a wonderful community time. And so within two weeks' time, after we shut the market down, we opened up the Healthy Food Hub with no working capital and sheer determination uh, at a grassroots level. And we've been going winter, spring, summer, fall since then. Now we have a food production component. Uh, we have uh, been gifted with, uh, thanks to the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture, with um, the Rotating Apprenticeship Farmer Training, where we're training the next generation of black farmers. Uh, in the town where I live, uh, where the Echo Campus is in Pembroke, which used to be one of the largest uh, black farming communities north of the Mason-Dixon line. And so we're still working on the food aggregation, but we've actually walked through this whole process 
within the first year of the farmer training. And we constantly have promotion, education, and training happening uh, for the community, for our, for our farm trainees. And so this is, um, this is Ms. Seals. And uh, Ms. Seals is, was the matriarch of our community. Uh, she was a nurse, um, a rancher, um, and a farmer. And uh, she supplies uh, still, her family supplies the eggs for our market uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. And she died in November of last year. So unlike most of the uh, statistics that um, people hear about when it comes to farms and the necessity of transfer of skills and land uh, in other communities, uh, in the black community, uh, our farmers are 70 and 80 years old and they're, they're dying quickly. Uh, oftentimes uh, there is no desire on the part of their children to take over the farm. So we're reweaving and reconnecting. Uh, black farmers are literally 0.1%, 0.1% of all farmers in the United States of America for a host of reasons. And so it's so necessary <laughs> that we be given the support uh, like the salamanders and the frogs <laughs> to, uh, to repopulate ourselves. Um, and so what it is that the work that we've been doing has done is allowed in so many ways for us to reconnect, reconnect family, reconnect to nature, and reconnect to community because the beauty um, is that our ancient memory is not that far away from us. And, uh, and whenever we connect with nature, then that memory is awakened. And so here's uh, some of our trainees. They're learning about, uh, about a whole host of things. Uh, and then we've started in a rural setting there in Pembroke, and right now we're actually extending on in to suburban and urban areas. Uh, so they're getting a wide range. It's a two-year intensive uh, with the aim of at the end of the second year, they will actually be very comfortable with starting to farm full-time. Our commitment is full-time farmers that they'll actually be able to make a career of farming. And they're actually, unlike our ancestors who were not in control of every part of the supply chain, they're being taught um, aggregation, uh, pro seedling production, and aggregation as well. And, and I'll show you the pictures of the aggregation. So let me stop with this one. So whenever we have trainings, we have community planting days. And uh, it's really wonderful for the children because they can go, they literally know where food comes from because they come out to the land and they see it and then they, they see the food at the market and they're just with us at every step. So this is a com community ritual that we started <laughs> um, last year. Uh, we are actually stomping teff in the ground. I don't know how many, how many people know what teff is? Okay, so um, I'm thinking uh, that teff is going to be one of those resilient, uh, important plants uh, for the years to come. Um, not only does it have all the essential amino acids, um, but it can grow under a whole wide range of environments. It can uh, poor soil, wet soil, dry soil, and, um, and it's been good for uh, conservation-wise. It's been good as a cover crop because it only lasts in our temperate zone from uh, frost to frost. And so we're literally seeding um, the, the teff, and this is what it looked like in the fall. And, um, and so now it's looking all uh, beige and dyed and laid down, and this is where we're gonna be doing our, we're in the process of doing our first no-till with the farmer trainees. Um, so it's been really exciting being able to be in this whole process of learning, not just with our trainees, but the entire community and everyone being involved. It's allowed us to all reconnect and, and remember. So our farmer trainees are learning how to, uh, to literally plant row crops as well as uh, to do high tunnel production. 
and they're learning about on-farm aggregation. And this is uh, them actually doing their CSA. We had a uh, green share, and um, it was really a, uh, important because uh, CSAs are a new concept in our community. Um, so while a lot of communities, uh, folks are just laying down 400, 500, 800 dollars in a pop, um, this whole concept of giving somebody money in advance and you know, are you going to really show up? <laughs> you know, are you going to, is it going to be good? It was, it was a huge step. But again, with this years of developing trust and people being able to prepay for their food and being able to, to come to our markets and get the food that they paid for, we're in developing that community again. By the time we got our farmer trainees, our community was ready. And, uh, and our farmer trainees were able to deliver. And so they had a chance to walk through all the aspects of, of those three spokes of community wealth, uh, the food production, the food aggregation, and food distribution. They did an, an excellent job. And so the, the market is this really special place for us because as a people, in general, we're disrespected wherever we go. Everybody thinks that we're less than. And, uh, and we tolerate it or they tolerate us, but in a place where death and destruction and despair has been looming too large uh, for the time that we have the market, it's a place of life, a place of healing, a place of light. It's a place where we all honor, are able to honor each other. And that's been so sacred for our young people. Uh, whether they're 20, 30, 40 something years old, you can tell I'm old because I'm saying 40 is young. <laughs> or whether they're the, just the young children, uh, children love to come because it's one of the few places that they get to play and play with each other and their mothers and fathers aren't holding on to them for dear life. So they always like to come. It got to the point where I kind of knew who was crying because it was time to go. <laughs> so. We do this for the children. And the beautiful thing, again, about uh, the Healthy Food Hub and having this be a community-based effort is that the parents, the families become involved, and through the food, the children are reconnecting with nature and having this relationship. So they physically come out to the Echo Campus and experience nature and have this opportunity to roam and have relations in a way that an urban setting that they live in won't allow. And so these are our stewards of the future. And um, they're having um, this understanding that they have to be the ones to, to maintain and uphold and keep life. And so we are charged with the responsibility of caring for what we have and doing that recovery, doing that remembering, doing that reweaving so that we'll have something to give to our young people. And it's, a, it's been an honor and a joy uh, to pick up these pieces and put them in our pouches and prepare to go down the green path. So thank you. Thank you.